Okay, hi everyone. So we're going to start with sort of, it's a shame we don't have another few people, but hey, never mind, we will make the best of it. We're going to start with um, a bunch of games from beginner group class that well, I'll just pretend you're my students, yeah. and that's the easiest and most fun way to learn them. And then also if you have games that you've used in group class or you've seen, feel free to offer one and we can try it and then give feedback on how it works. So let's start with Al. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start the games, we're just going to warm up. So let's just like go through our twinkles. So remind yourself of all the things we've been talking about. You're looking for soft knees, even weight across your ankles, that heaviness in your arm with the lightness on the wrist, beautiful bow hold, balanced belly position, heavy head. Just a couple of things. No wonder violin is difficult, right? <laughs> <laughs>
sounds. So explore, don't feel that you have to just find the perfect sound straight away. Just experiment, is it better if I have a tighter hand and a lighter elbow? Is it better with a heavier elbow and a lighter hand? Do I just need less of everything? Am I too close to the bridge? Is it only at the heel or is it only at the tip? Not tip, the up bow start. It's probably more at the heel. Just experiment and kind of try and zone into your own sound. It's hard when we're all together, but it's really good to kind of focus that listening. Feel 
also. anything I ask you to do I will be able to justify and if I can't justify it then you don't have to do it you don't have to do it anyway but you know there's an <laughs> obvious reason not to do it but I think for 90% of the things that we do with the ki with the kids and for ourselves is about the sound mm -hmm. if you if you do it like this does it sound better yes okay so let's do it yeah if it doesn't sound better either you need to practice it more because it's not actually happening right yet or it's not worth doing so do something else yeah should we just do a few more Good. Can you get the same sound at the tip to start as you can here? Yes. By the way, there is a my uh, thumb put his finger a little oily hand. Oh, oh lovely. Sounds <laughs> funny, which I can. You know, you can. There's a video on my YouTube channel about how to clean it with fairy liquid. Oh really? Oh, I will definitely. <laughs> Too bad though, it's still got rotten on it. Nice. Beautiful. So think more about a little bit more speed. kids love that. Good, and now just try your up bow. So thinking about engage here and then drop there. Very good here. Can we do it one more time? So think about, just relax your elbow, but let it float, and then the impetus is like coming in towards you. Better. If the up bow is very weird. Yeah. It feels very I've odd. never seen this much detail. Ah, uh, well, there you go. This is what the next year will be all about. It's like, oh, wow, there's so much. I mean, there's so much, right? It's fascinating. Good. Yeah. Excellent. And we put freezing spray on your hands because you're only four years old, so you don't have any finger flexibility on your bow hold yet. Better. Good. sound that you can hear, can you hear it? It's from the hand. If you get a sound, that's probably from the arm, although it can be from either. And you're just slightly not straight with the bridge. Okay, let's just try a few more. Good. It's okay, but yeah, it's become it's becoming clearer what you're aiming for, even if it's not happening yet. Good, great. Okay, so find your sound. You're just that's it. So the little ones only go right to the heel, like mm -hmm. below the balance point on Happy Farmer. Oh yeah. I mean, sometimes they do a little bit beforehand, but that's the teaching point for Happy Farmer. Mm -hmm. So we always start with the heel at the balance point, not the heel at the beginning. do it 
and consolidation. I can do it pretty much without thinking about it. I'm going to go and get a decent lens. cooperation, consolidation, and that is called the staircase of learning, but actually it kind of should look like this, <laughs> because mostly we can understand quite quickly, we can do it quite quickly because we break it down enough that it's possible, but then between comprehension and consolidation is 10,000 repetitions to make it like something you can never get wrong. But that doesn't look like a staircase. <laughs> okay, let's play some games. Just move this. at the Suzuki Hub. Banj, come here. children who've hardly had any lessons, you need a lot of different activities that don't require them playing the violin, otherwise it doesn't work. So one of the games that they really like is called Sharks in the Water and we're going to play it and then we're going to think about what it actually develops in the children and their parents. So. You've all been listening to your recordings lots and lots, haven't you? Yeah. Good. So, I'm going to play you, you can do this on the violin or you can do it on the piano. Uh, I'm going to play you some Suzuki pieces and while it sounds right, you're going to be little fish swimming around in the ocean and then when you hear something that's wrong, that means there's a shark in the water and you've got to get on an island and if you want to, you can scream. <laughs> this is a very good example of pre-twinkler group lessons being completely chaotic, but, well no, it's not completely chaotic, it's slightly chaotic, but they're still learning really good stuff. So you don't need your violins. So please get ready to swim like little fish or tourists. <laughs> tourists in shark-ridden waters. Okay, so.
Children of Korah is going to tell you that that's not how a children's folk song goes mm -hmm. from the UK. But... That could be exactly right. Mm -hmm. So you do want to make it sophisticated enough that the children don't just know because it sounds clashy. Mm -hmm. And let's have a seat. Very good sharps in the water. Not very good screaming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So what does this do for the children and their parents? Teaches them to listen. Good. Oh, I didn't but hear it. Um, hear it. What, how does it help? Ah. What are the educational benefits of this? Uh, he is aware of the details. He doesn't have to be like a simple mm -hmm. or a very tricky um, mistake. And if they have like to listen properly, not just... Yeah. Excellent. So careful listening in the game, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that means that if they're talking, they'll miss out. If they're screaming all the time, they'll miss out. You know, it does build a sense of what you need to do in order to succeed at the task. Mm -hmm. Without you saying, concentrate, be quiet, otherwise we won't be able to hear. <laughs> and you know, those kind of learning activities are really brilliant because you want the children to want to succeed and therefore to do the right thing without having been told as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Good. What else does it help with? It's yeah. kind of all playing. Yeah. The very beginning of oral play. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. And they're not listening to the way to the play. They learn that much. Yeah. They, I mean, I think <laughs> they would have lots of them do dare, but it does really show you without shaming anyone who is listening to the recordings, who knows those pieces really well. If you do it regularly with kids, you'll see, you know which children are gonna be first on the map. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mostly, they'll be the ones that are listening every day. Mm -hmm. And the children who are like, oh, I'm on the map because everyone else is on the mat, are the ones that you can have a quiet word with afterwards and say, how's the listening going? Just checking, are you listening to the whole recording? Mm -hmm. the, the common misconceptions about listening is that you listen to your working piece, Yeah, that's it. You do listening in practice. Lots of kids, once they're a bit further in, on in book one, think that it's a good idea to play along with the CD, which sometimes it is, but that means that they're not listening. They're listening to themselves plus the recording. Mm -hmm. So you can just have a checklist of like, are you listening to all of it? Are you listening separately from when you play? Is your child so zoned out that they're not hearing it even though it's on? Some people put it on at bedtime, which can be great, but if you've got a kid who falls asleep like that, they're never gonna hear him further than go to our roadie. So, you know, for some of my students who do their listening at bedtime, I say, can you start it during bath time? Mm -hmm. Or during, you know, as soon as you go to the bedroom or upstairs or whatever, you know, your, however your house is configured, um, can you start it earlier so that you know that they're gonna hear at least 20 minutes of, that's most of the book, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, also, you might want to put it on um, shuffle, mm -hmm. but it is also helpful for them to hear in the right order mm -hmm. because they get to know the structure of the book. Mm -hmm. um, good, and it shows, I mean, I think on a very kind of esoteric level, I'm not sure that I actually know what that means, anyway. <laughs> Another 
really good one for non-instrumental game is uh, <gasps> walking to the beat. So one of the core things that is tricky for very young musicians to learn is the ability to feel the beat, the pulse, and also to recognize the difference between pulse and rhythm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of children, so let's, let's hop up, you can have time to write afterwards. So I want you to walk the beat, you can march around and see if you can keep your feet, you know, moving with the music. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give any more, any more specific instructions than that. Okay, so here we go. listen to it enough. 
So you'll want to choose one piece and do it like that's your task for that bit of the group would be. Let's see if we can get the whole class doing the first line of Go to Mount Rayleigh with no mistakes. Mm. That might take several weeks. And you might give everyone a star when they get it right. Um, or it might be straight away. And you have some memorization as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really, all of these games are really good to get the parents doing as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things we see a lot in Suzuki groups is parents on phones, children doing the lesson. Personally, I think unless you're involving the parents, like more actively than them just being in the room, it's kind of acceptable for them to be on their phones because if you're not involved, if you're not bringing them something, why should they bring you their attention? Mm. Uh, so I say to my parents, can I just have your attention for a minute? I just want to explain why the cup game is so useful. We're going to do that next. It's because of blah, blah, blah. Okay, now you can go back to your phones. Some people, of course, are there like rats are so in love with their children, they're just like, oh my god, look at them, they can make a phone all by themselves, it's so delightful. <laughs> um, but others are like, oh yeah, Facebook, you know? Fine for me. It's up to each individual person how they make those decisions. But it can be really nice to bring them in and out a bit. So, like, okay, we're going to do a game, parents up and come. Don't just go to your child necessarily, you know, find a child you don't know, say hi, introduce yourself, tell them who your child is. Okay, let's do the game. And then sometimes it will be games with parents and children, their own children. And if you've got kids who are not with their parents, you'll need to find someone to help them. Uh, good. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. Who can tell me where the first piece that's not in simple time, i.e. 2-4 or 4-4, four, four, in book one comes? Mm -hmm. Well done. It is. So we have loads and loads of time before they before they play in 3-4, but they are hopefully listening from their first lesson. Uh, and one of the big tests in oral tests for exams and things like that, and, and like general musicianship things that you want to develop for your students is an ability to hear the pulse, which most people can straight away, and identify the time signature, which most people can't. Okay. So the very young version of 3-4 versus 4-4, four, four, um, or you know, duple versus triple time is the the dancing versus marching, mm -hmm. and so so we'll say okay, so we're going to play. Um, you know, let's walk to the beat. You don't have to walk to the beat if you want to. If you want to, go for it. <laughs> um, so we might play. Most of the time, the kids can identify simple time really easily, but they misidentify triple time as, as, as double time. Does that make sense? Yes. So then, if you play... You'll get kids going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm marching, because they can feel the beat, but they haven't felt where the downbeat is. It's um, three, four... No, oh, compound time is quaver, yeah, like the A underneath, but it's triple time because it's oh, yeah. three. Yeah. I may have said the wrong words. <laughs> yeah, duple versus triple, yeah, is the two, you know, versus the three. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't touch six, eight for ages, but you know, you can also play like waltz from book two if you know it. someone put, put their hand up because they're coming to the Suzuki Hub or because they've got an older sibling or because they're, they've gone to a concert or even maybe they've got a very keen parent who's already playing the book too. Um, and you could be like, you know, one day you're going to play that, so let's walk the beat first. So the swaying sort of triple time um, <coughs> is the bit that they need to spend some time that takes a long time for them to get right. Any questions about that? So do you talk about 
the first seat of the bargain, is that how we get them to learn to say no? I wouldn't, it depends what age group you're talking about, but if you're talking about sort of four, four or five year olds, we just talk about strong beats and weak beats that we might hear, for example, okay, so you might hear, do, 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 do. can you hear that it doesn't go, and make it all like physical, so let's stand up, and we'll just pretend to do this part of the group. Okay, so let's let's walk the beat to this piece and see if you can uh, feel if it's marching or dancing. you don't have a piano where you're teaching, you can't do it. 
I'm sure there's a way with technology, but I haven't found it yet, an app or something. But the other game that's really fun to do and very quick is happy, sad, major, minor. <laughs> so, uh, so when you first introduce it, if you're not used to the piano, you see. Okay, so you might find just a C in the left hand, or you might just do right hand, a major arpeggio, or you might use both hands to do, it's fine, as long as you have the whole arpeggio chord, the whole chord. Okay, so when we're in a major key, we're going to feel really happy. It sounds like it's a happy chord, even if, when it's in different notes. separate and quite a lot of non-instrument games like we've just done um, as well as a lot of playing on the e-string while the kids who can play with their fingers might be playing with their fingers etc so the setup time for when they're going to play is like 
a, a very, you have to judge how much time you're going to help them set up according to how perfect you want what they're doing to be. So if you want to, if you're playing, if you're practicing for a concert and they're going to be in a play together and they're going to play Fatima and Caterpillar in the play together, you kind of want them to play because in that concert they are not going to be there being like best feet, best bow hold, best violin position. Some of them might, but mostly they're not. And also, if you do take all that care and time to set them up perfectly every time they do something in group, it can get quite frustrating for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you've got a big group, if you're checking the bow holds, by the time you get to the last one, the first one's bow hold has gone like bleh, because they're just tiny and melting. Um, so I think there is a time and a place for being really picky about how they're doing what they're doing, but there is definitely a time and a place for just like, okay, let's have a go. Just get the violin under your chin and play some music, even if it's open E, and then, you know, with time, it becomes more accurate. Mm -hmm. So the cup game is a really good way to put the spotlight on the bow hold. So let's make our best beginner Suzuki bow holds. We haven't really talked about this yet. So I'm a big fan of putting a little bit of the thumb on the hair so that they're actually kind of against the top of the ferrule. Is that what this thing is called? I just yeah. learned. I just learned the name for it about a year ago, and I can't. I think it is called the ferrule. Um, because if you put it here, mm -hmm. then when they go inside, they have to change everything because it's too low. Whereas if it's here, even the angle is right, and then literally the only thing you do is close this joint a bit. Um, and if you put it just on the silver, it just slides around yeah. a lot. And it creates a bit of tension. Small so fingers are sweaty. Like exactly. Right. So we make a V. So you make a V shape and you a little bit on the hair and a little bit on the silver. Mm -hmm. And it's this corner, that corner of the nail, that you want to make sure they're really making mm -hmm. contact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the top corner. corner. Yeah, exactly there. Okay. And yeah. like it's a little bit on this side, it's more like closer to feeling of that. Okay. I don't think you want it on this corner because they'll just it'll just come this way. They'll slide off. You want it there yeah. Okay. yeah i see what you're saying oh yeah that the idea is good but also i think yeah it depends it's stronger like that yeah it's a bit more like you know by it's definitely strong hold yeah i think we're not too worried about how strong it is in terms of squeezing but we want it to be very stable for them mm -hmm. so they don't drop the bow which they will oh, yeah. a million times every week anyway um, so yeah, you're checking for the V, you're checking for a bent thumb. Why do we want a bent thumb? This creates tension. Good. So, well, there's more tension. If you do it here, definitely there's more tension. And you have more control, exactly. Yeah. More flexibility equals more control. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to ask the parents of new mm -hmm. students on violin why they need a bent thumb because they can all tell you that they should have a bent thumb mm -hmm. but the number of people who can tell you why is tiny mm -hmm. so do make sure you're explaining to your students mm -hmm. and their parents why because of course if they understand that it's a good idea not just something you're telling them to do mm -hmm. they will be more invested in doing it well, what would you tell i mean they wouldn't understand control i've, I've had a problem yeah they would well, they sure yeah oh, okay you know, if you're on your bike and you try and, you know, if they want to like a balance bike or something, yeah. if you hold the if you hold the handlebars like this, does it feel good? No, because you don't have enough control. Uh, you need to put your whole hand around it so you have control. Right. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. And then, um, so we're going to talk more about making bow holds and I don't want to go too long right now. But we can make the bow hold bunny. Mm -hmm. Lots of them will start with this. So you're covering the thumbnail with the two middle ones and then you've got your ears and they can give little hello bunny kisses <laughs> and they can sniffle their, sniffle their nose and waggle their ears and some children will find this very hard and need to spend quite a long time just practicing getting it right. You may see teachers say make sure you don't make the fox because he's really big and scary. I don't do this because every child loves the fox. <laughs> They're like oh yeah big and scary, excellent. So I don't even mention that. Maybe but it's a to you. Uh, a fox. What yeah. about wolf? Maybe yeah, but just anything that's anything that's exciting, uh, yes, that's they will want to do. So <laughs> just like just go with cute. Here you have your bunny. You're going to open your bunny's mouth, and you're going to put the carrot in its mouth. 
And can you find the bottom teeth in the right place, first of all? Yeah. And then you've got these two just like almost in a circle. Mm -hmm. And you can also, I also talk about this bit being the treasure, that the second mm -hmm. finger wants to touch the treasure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and finger, no, we'll talk about that in a minute. So then you have this, and then you prop your first finger on. For most bows, it's exactly on the join between the black and the silver. But sometimes, like yours yeah. and yours, the black is a bit too long. But most of the children's bows, mm -hmm. it will be exactly there. Yeah. Uh, and then the little finger, you want to... We're going to talk about it in more detail when we get to bow holds properly. But the nail on the top and the flesh on the side mm -hmm. is what I teach. How many people say that's best friends, those two fingers best friends? Two, right? two and three, yeah, two. I think for, for most kids I have about a finger space between one and two and yeah. three and four. And the, the, so it's not evenly spaced because yeah. it makes it too wide. Mm. Yeah. But do you have to cover that spot or is that optional? No, so what I do is finger, finger, finger spot. <laughs> finger, finger, finger spot. Because oh. if you're doing it this way, then you've got a lot of what's called pronation, which is when you're leaning towards the bow with the first finger. And that brings the elbow up. Just I really like that finger, finger, finger spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then the cup game is make a circle. You can also do it in teams, but we're going to do the, the nicer version today. Okay. And so here's the deal. I'm going to be watching all your bow holds. And if I see something that's wrong, then we're going to have to fix it before you can give the cup away. So make sure you've got your best bow hold, and let's keep checking everybody's bow holds. And then so you can take your bow hold. Excellent. And do you have your best bow hold? Of course you do. Brilliant. And Jacqueline has your bow hold. Wonderful. You can take the cup. So we do it very slowly and carefully with lots of checking of the children's bow holds, first of all. So that's a wonderful bow hold. Well done. Very good. And then later on, you can time it so they do it really quickly. So they're like in, trial, in control mm -hmm. of keeping their own good bow holds. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to, at a certain point, you can put them in two lines opposite each other and have two cups that go down the line and see yeah. who wins. And then you get disqualified if your bow hold's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really mindful of your bow hold. Okay? Yeah. Great. Let's write that down and then we'll have a break. <coughs> Uh, there is a game that I do. Oh yes, please. With, uh, some of my beginners, when I'm like uh, beginners starting at seven, and I mm -hmm. like that is my uh, this one. That is like so they feel the weight on the on the index finger. Yeah. Very normally, and then on the pinky, so they have control of the pinky because yeah. What they do a lot when they play is that yeah. So when we do this exercise, I yeah. feel like they can control a little bit more. Yeah. But I don't know if that's if I should use that with the small one. So um, I think I just want to say about the little finger. I only changed it when I was like quite late in my twenties. I think I just saw this guy do like a CPD continuous professional development session. There were like a thousand teachers in the room. It wasn't like an individual thing. But he had a, um, a skewer hmm. and he was like, this is one of the things I use all the time for my teaching because we find this gap between the nail and the flesh. And I was like, oh, what's going on? And then he said, and then when we put it on the bow, we find the same, you have to have a hexagonal frog. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work if it's round. But 90% of the kids' bows are hexagonal. and. A new bow costs like fifteen pounds. I just tell them they have to buy a new one mm -hmm. um, if it's round frog. Uh, so we put the flesh on the plane that is facing the like. So you've got the top one. That's where the nail goes, and then the one facing you mm -hmm. is where the flesh goes. And the reason this is so brilliant because when I was taught and when I trained, first of all, we always had the the bow, the little finger just on top of the bow, which is great for this but useless for changing the, the contact point mm -hmm. because it just slides off because there's nothing to stop it sliding. Um, and the other thing that we see a lot, sorry, that's, I think my phone is having a bit of light. That's because I always can't to get away. Um, the other thing that we see a lot is those corn plaster or like bow hold buddies. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about any that stuff. It can be a really helpful crutch while you find your feet on how to teach a good bow hold. Mm. It solves a problem. It doesn't solve the problem. It, it d 
delay is a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you are finding that as a new teacher, if you are a new teacher, you're, the technique is overwhelming and your kids are like, you know, this is what happened for me. I was like, <laughs> my kid can't do anything and I can't fix it all at once. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And so in that situation, okay, yeah, there's something you can put on the bow that means their finger goes in the right place so you can help them with this, fantastic. It could be helpful. For me, in my teaching now, I don't ever use them because I think if they can get that feeling straight away, mm -hmm. then they can do a really good bow hold. Um, but you know, it's a good stopgap. But just be aware it doesn't fix anything, it just puts it off. Mm -hmm. When you take it off, the same problem will come unless you actually then fix it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, yeah, the thing with the nail bed is that you can do this way as well, mm -hmm. which is amazing for changing. You know, it transformed my playing, certainly. And also, the, um, my son was doing that game with Amy at the very beginning for ball ball, mm -hmm. like a fishing game. Yeah. They were putting a little uh, magnet here. Yeah. And a little fish. Uh, yeah. And he I've, was I've got one. We're gonna. That and do yeah. That exactly like Jack. And yeah. So they do that moment in that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Or like uh, up like it. Uh, exactly. Because you want to strengthen the little finger. So what so, you're talking to yourself about it? Is it about it? Is yeah, so I think the answer is yes, you can do it with the little ones. There are three main ways we do. So let's get bows and not violins. And we'll just do these three and then we'll stop for a break. So the rocket song goes like this. And you can also do it with a hula hoop on the top, which is fun because then they eat it at the end. <laughs> Unless it's fallen off. And if it falls off, you have to make a choice about whether you're just going to put it back on or get another one. And some of the parents will have very strong feelings about which is correct. So we start low, and we're gonna make our bows into a rocket, and the song goes like this. Up like a rocket, down like the rain, all the way to the floor, backwards and forwards like an express train, choo-choo train, doesn't matter. And then some people add in, I tend not to, because it destroys the song structure. <laughs> uh, in and out like an intercity train. Um, land on a planet, fly around the sun. Now, when you're doing this, as the teacher, you want to go clockwise. Don't look at me. You want to go clockwise because then a child, I'm gonna be your student, a child following you is going anti-clockwise, which is a down bow retake on a different angle. Yeah. So we have to practice doing it wrong so that they can follow us. Yes. Yeah, so land on a planet, fly around the sun and then sometimes you can paint your face different colours what face paint are you going to put on I'm going to be a tiger I'm going to be a butterfly I'm like, wonderful and then if they've still got the um, hula hoop on the end pop it in your mouth with your big strong thumb press with the thumb and it goes if it doesn't and you feel that they're sensible enough not to poke themselves in the eye you can tap it on your nose with your big strong thumb. I tend to do that in individual lessons rather than group because I'm a bit worried about this whole thing. Yeah. Um, but then you can also like tap it on your finger with your big strong thumb or whatever. Yeah. Shoulder. Or put it on your head. Or put it on your head. But how's it finished? Check your fingers. Shoulder. Check your fingers and your thumb. That's what I. Yeah. But I mean, there are so many different versions yeah. of these. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the rocket song versions. This feels really tense to me. Yeah. Is it because we've got longer bows or is it for everyone? I mean, I think it's because we're super aware. For oh, them yeah. it lasts two seconds and yeah. then they've eaten the thing and it's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I think most of them, their bow will be the same length proportionally to them mm -hmm. as ours is to us. Yeah. But I think it's, just, you know, yeah. it's a moment in time. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I certainly wouldn't want to do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a song that goes around, around, around we go, up and down, up and down, around, around, around we go, in and out, and up and down. Yeah, and that's like also basically anything that you can do that gets the bow moving while they're holding the bow hold and just kind of mobilizes the right arm and shoulder is really good. Make um, staring, which is top. Exactly, yeah. make a spell, yeah. yeah. Make a cake, what are you gonna put in your cake? You know, and then you'll have like, some children will be like, strawberries and chocolate, and then other children will be like, rat's tails, yeah. <laughs> and that's fun. So you can do whatever you like, but the cooking one is quite good, because you make, make a, 
yeah. you know, make the thing and then you have to whisk it mm -hmm. and then you have to stir it and then you have to open the oven, slide it in, close the oven, doesn't work so well in the circle, <laughs> it's better in the uh, and then check it, see if the see if it's good, it's still good. Yeah, good. All of those things, just everything to kind of get it moving. Uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round. If you do this with a hula hoop, you do round and round wheels. You do people standing up, sit down, stand up, sit down, and then you eat it, and then you do the rinse and wipers. Yeah. Otherwise, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> just flies off. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are millions of bow hold things. They will come more and more as we go through them, but that's a very good sort of set to start with. So let's just write down what we did before we have a break. So we've got the cup game, slow-mo. And then the cup game kind of race version. Either against the clock or two teams. Don't forget to check the thumbs because you can see everything from the outside except the thumb and lots of kids will straighten their thumbs without you realising unless you're really peering in. <laughs> Suzuki, Kate Conway Suzuki channel, there is a pre-twinkle playlist of things. I was a bit cross the other night and posted some comment that I probably shouldn't have. This person posted a lot of horrible sounds on this video. And I was just like, what do you expect me to, how, how are you expecting me to respond to that? And someone else was like, sorry, but it's so out of tune about the student. And I was like, yeah, and if you watch past the first minute, that's what we're working on. Like, this is not a performance video. This is a lesson. Oh. Here is how to work on if your student comes back from the holidays playing out of tune, which is what happened with her. I was just like, people are like, so weird. Yes. <laughs> Fine, yeah. Uh, right, let me have a look. Pre-Twinkle Violin Steps has how to make a bow hold, double monk, oh loads of stuff. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to put the um, the link to that in the group chat as well. Okay, great. Um, yeah, wheels on the bus, rocket 
thoughts on cakes, potions, and a round around. Does someone want to just video me doing a round around because it's not on YouTube? And then you can post it in the chat. No, no, just one, and then oh, I'll put it on the WhatsApp. Okay. I'll put it on the WhatsApp chat so it's always in the same place. Okay, so this is around, around. So you go around, around, around we go. Up and down, up and down. Around, around, around we go. In and out, and up and down. And then you check the vocals. It's inspired. <laughs> <laughs> And hula hoops are your friend. Great, let's take 10 minutes and then we'll have lunch in an hour. Should I keep going there? Yes, please. Okay, so why group class? Learning from each other. Good, learning from each other. Do we want to make a note? No, I don't really want to make a list on the board. You just write down what you think. You need to write down. Jacqueline? Um, learn how to play together. Learn how to play together. Excellent. Learn how to play together. I Do you want to do that? Come in. <laughs> I've got I'm extremely far away. I'm lonely. Um, every orchestra 
is an amazing tiny group class each section, right? Mm -hmm. Like the idea, I've never really understood this, that people will say, well, why do you, why do, you do group class? Because you never play in unison in the real world. Well, no, you don't play Mozart violin concerto in unison, but if you're not playing Brahms one in unison in the first violins, then there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, every band has to be a really great group of playing together. And this can start from three or four years old, learning how to play busy busy stop stop on E together. Mm -hmm. um, so learning to play really well, and then all of the non-musical aspects like working in a team, mm -hmm. dealing with different social interactions. It's inclusive. So inclusive, inclusion. exactly. Being able to sometimes lead, sometimes be led sometimes understand, sometimes not understand, to kind of, you know, have a varied experience of what it is. I think that part's really important because in individual lessons, if we are doing our job well, the child will understand 90% of what we're doing 90% of the time. That's kind of what you want, isn't it? In an individual lesson, you want to teach at the level of the student. You don't want anything to be like, <clears throat> What are you talking about? When if you have a kid in front of you in a private lesson who doesn't understand what you're trying to get at, that's on you. You're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. But in a group class, there are going to be times when they don't understand because you've explained it too quickly, or because you can't teach at, in a way that every child understands 100 percent because they all learn differently and they're all at different stages. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for them to develop that robustness of like, this is okay. Yeah, I'll just have a go. Sometimes you can play the piece, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to listen, sometimes you won't understand what they spoke, you know, you won't have been listening because you would have been chatting to your friend about your new shoelaces. And you know, you have to just be able to kind of go either, what are we doing? And deal with that, or just like pick it up from the people around you. And these are all like really important life skills, yeah. aren't they? Like, you don't want a child who goes into the world as an adult who's never been in a situation where they feel out of their depth, who's never been in a situation where they feel they've done something a bit wrong, who's never been in a situation, like these are people who are gonna find adult life really difficult. Mm -hmm. And you want to give them really gentle and caring opportunities to kind of experience that. Mm -hmm. um, and on a practical level, group class means we can put on concerts where everyone plays something together. You know, you can't really do that so easy if they're just doing individual lessons. It means they have another 40 minutes of tuition each week. You know, if you look at Suzuki versus traditional, that doesn't exist. But if we think about a situation where a kid might be having a 20 minute private lesson at school with no parental help and <coughs> no expectation, no clear expectation of practice, that child may practice a couple of times a week, mm -hmm. may also not. If they do, the parents are not gonna know how to help them at all unless they happen to be musicians on the same instrument. Uh, and they're probably <coughs> going to play for maybe 10 minutes, so they probably will play approximately 40 minutes a week. Yeah. And those are the keen ones who are practicing a couple of times. Mm. Whereas in the Suzuki structure, you have your 30 minute individual lesson, 40 minute group lesson, sometimes 45, sometimes an hour, depends on how you set it up. I wouldn't recommend you set up a 40 an hour long beginner group class, but it's possible. This is much harder for you. <laughs> 45 minutes is much uh, nicer on the teacher. Um, at Suzuki Hub, they also have the Music Mind Games, 35 minutes. So, you know, our students are doing nearly two hours of tuition. That's before they've even done a single thing at home. Mm -hmm. Of course, these kids are going to progress better than children who are not supported in that way. Mm -hmm. They also pick up, like we were talking about with all the listening games, they pick up a lot of information about what they're doing versus what else other people are doing and where they fall in the pecking order, which can be difficult and needs managing sometimes, but can also be really helpful. Lots of families are gonna do what you want them to do so that they don't stick out in group as not doing it, not because you've asked them to exactly. do it. <laughs> Yeah. And not because, probably not even consciously. Lots of parents are really uh, competitive. They want their kids to be at the top of the group. That can be helpful, also can be really unhelpful. Lots of children are saying they want to get onto the next piece. For some of those kids, that means you have to really 
make sure that you're emphasizing how important it is to do each thing well rather than just do it just across the line and then get into the next piece into the next book onto the next grade whatever but for each child which it's a problem for i think there are other children who do more to keep up with their friends in group which is really positive for them so as always it's you know a balance and it's about an individual relationship to each part of what we're offering and that's why offering all of these different things is so brilliant is because there's much more likely to be something that everyone loves mm. or rather sorry something for everyone to love mm. than if you offer one thing if the children don't love that the yeah. joy has gone ebbed away and then they'll want to quit or they'll become parents who's they'll become adults who are like yeah my parents made me do violin for 10 years i hated it can't believe they did it for so long mm -hmm. this is also not great this is not imparting the love of music is it no i really like the harmony that was done in the group lesson as well you know when she teaches i can't remember her name harry probably definitely tommy no that lady uh johanna johanna yeah <clears throat> i'm teaching them all by ear one part and at a really high speed and yeah yeah i'm not that fast but yeah, no, quickly. Incredibly good yeah, I tell you what, if you yeah. want to see how quickly someone can learn by ear, when it's really, really by ear, mm -hmm. yesterday, so whatever the date was yesterday, the 2nd of October, I was teaching Riker, and I know his mum won't mind me mentioning this because she's the one who was happy to have everything like videoed from the start. Riker started his lessons in the teacher training. He used to come in and do his lessons in front of all the teacher trainees every week. Yeah, it's amazing. He, he rises to an audience. Anyway, they've had a problem with listening. They haven't really found their like routine for listening. We've tried lots of different things. Now she's trying a, 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 a alarm on her phone to remind her. They're homeschooled kids, so they have quite a kind of free structure to their days, which is great in lots of ways, but also means you don't have that routine of like, you know, in the mornings we put the CD on as, as soon as you get up and put the recording on. Anyway, and, um, and so he's been, um, he just got his credit for O Come Little Children. Yay, Riker, it's such a hard piece. But you know, I've been thinking that he's gonna get his credit the next time for about three lessons. And so I said to her yesterday, okay, we're not gonna do uh, May song, which is the next piece straight away. What I want you to try and do is, Riker, can you just see how much of Happy Birthday you can play if you start on D? He's never really done the D string even before. He was so excited. He literally worked out in about one and a half minutes, the first two, like, like up to, that bit as well, that, that little bit, which is maybe a quarter of most Suzuki pieces at that level. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, so here is a child who's just worked that out in 90 seconds, who has needed an extra two weeks, and he's practiced well. They did six practices last week and four the week before to get O Come Little Children. That is because O Come Little Children is nowhere near embedded in his mind in learning by ear as happy birthday which of course it's not because everyone knows happy birthday backwards but you know i i hope that she didn't feel i was telling her off it was just a demonstration of like if you know a tune really well this is how quickly you can work it out when you don't know a tune really well what he's dealing with is not only how to play it but what happens next and it's a combination of remembering which finger is where a little bit of playing it by ear a little bit of muscle memory it's just a mess and that's why it's taken so long and so, you know, the, when you get the kids who really, and most of them by Joe's group, like book two, book three, are playing really well by ear, even if they haven't done brilliant listening just because they've been doing it for like six, seven years, mm -hmm. um, they can pick stuff up so quickly and you can do really brilliant like folk tunes and other stuff in parts. Yeah. Yeah, and it just makes it such a pleasure to be able to just, you know, like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Like, and then, you know, at the next level up, so like two groups ahead of them is my book five and six group, whose sight reading has got to the stage where we can do that as well. And, um, but uh, the Brahms Hungarian dance arranged for two violins, they basically sight read. It's like, look what we can do, just find some yeah. of music and give it to you. And then there it is, they can do it. It's brilliant. Yeah. So if you get all the pieces, you know, the puzzle works beautifully, but it's a lot of balls to keep in the air. <laughs> um, so back to group class. Um, 
in terms of practical decisions that you will make when and if you start your own group classes, I'm a firm believer in weekly being a really great idea. Yeah. But there are lots of Suzuki teachers who teach a monthly group class, even maybe even once a half term. Um, and of course there are pros and cons to both of those. If you do weekly, you are a asking people to do two sessions of Suzuki with you each week, which is going to put quite a lot of people off because it's intense. It also means that you're adding however long the travel time is on another day, which could be practice time. So if you've got someone who travels for 45 minutes each way, the difference between the hour and a half that they travel to their private lesson and then three hours a week to do private lesson and group lesson on a different day is quite significant. Mm -hmm. So in London, that tends not to be such a problem because people tend to find a teacher quite close to them. But also, there, aren't, there isn't a Suzuki teacher on every corner mm -hmm. by any means. So, you know, it's just something to be aware of that I think just try, I think basically just try and look at all the things, all the decisions that you make on the impacts on the families from all angles. Like, yes, it's ideal to have a situation where a child is doing a group lesson and a private lesson and hear music mind games every week. But the, the flip side to that is that for some of those families that will mean that they only practice three times a week because they can't practice on the day they're coming to the hub because they've got the travel time as well. And then they probably don't practice one day on the weekend because life is busy and, you know. So it's pros and cons, there's no perfect answer to it. But I do think, and I can't state this strongly enough, if you are gonna call yourself a Suzuki teacher and your kids do not come to group, that is not Suzuki approach. Mm -hmm. There's just no, I've had this conversation with so many people and they're like, but I'm doing everything else. And I'm like, it is a cornerstone. We have the Suzuki triangle, student, teacher, uh, parent, that is one Suzuki triangle. Mm -hmm. And at Suzuki Hub, we have another triangle, which is group lesson, private lesson, and music mind games. But you can also call it the, the, less, the learning triangle is your private lesson, your group lesson, and your practice. Or what happens at home perhaps in listening? Can I come in with a question? Yeah. Um, are, are you working with like schools, like primary schools and things like that? Because um, my son's school did uh, they are have teacher told me once. Are we are planning to start a Suzuki lessons in our schools or are this just one? Yeah, thing? so there's a thing called the Suzuki in Schools Initiative. Mm -hmm. Susie. <laughs> uh, which I'm the director of. I started it in <coughs> 2004. Um, and um, it kind of totally stopped during lockdown. I was going to step down and hope to find someone else who was going to take it on. There isn't really anyone who's ready to take it on in the same way that I was running it. So we now have a team of me and an assistant director and an administrator. But essentially, if the school is... They were going to start a Suzuki program, or they would like to start a Suzuki program. Yeah, to. Okay, so if you put them in touch with me, I will send them the information and we can look yeah, at it. Would you, would you teach there? Sorry? Would you teach there? Would you like to teach there? I would yes, love about to yeah. in schools, yes. Uh, because um, I spoke with the head teacher uh, when he was going to start reception, he did not need to. Yeah. Because they stay all apart. I spoke with their, uh, one of the teacher called Mary. She told me, because I sent them an email mm -hmm. last year, and I told them that they, I realized they don't have violin lessons at school mm -hmm. and all the, all the other instruments, and I was offering them, are you yeah. interested with it? I'm a violin teacher. And then she told me uh, two weeks ago, I will call you, like in Istanbul or something, so you can talk about the yeah. violin. And then if something, they didn't send me email yet, something happens like that I think the future as well yeah 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 so the Suzuki and schools initiative is um, I think now before COVID we had 12 schools I think we've now got five or six mm -hmm. but I mean thousands of kids have learned through it it's a bit like nuclear within schools it's not free the kids who can pay pay and the kids who can't pay are on discount mm -hmm. so it's sort of that this is yeah this is why I was really interested with the yeah. um, working in primary school yeah like, it's great i worked in primary schools for ages it's amazing to do your actual proper job in mm -hmm. the school time daytime brilliant mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, do I mean, send, send me an email and I can send you the information and then you can send it on to them. Yeah. Is there an opportunity to develop how it's done in a school? Kind of <sighs> Schools are really hard. Um, talk to Hannah. Do you know Hannah yeah. who's working here? Yeah. She works in a school in Clerkenwell. Um, and I've had a lot to do with that school. I think as long as you have a DBS, they would be all right with you going in to observe. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I think so. I have more children and I need to talk to them. You do need to get one, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's stop this because we don't need yeah. to discuss it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's on YouTube. But um, <laughs> does anyone have any other questions about group class? So ideally you would want to have the individual and the group class on the same day, so it would be easier. Well, it's impossible if you're going to have more than five or six kids in your group. Uh, unless it's a Saturday, in which maybe you could have ten, but then even then, if they've got a 9am lesson, private lesson, and a four o'clock group class or a one o'clock group class, they're going to complain because... It's serious. Yeah, like so... Mm. Here, lots of kids happen to have their private lesson and their group class on the same day, but it's because we've got five teachers teaching all at once mm -hmm. and one group class that all those kids go into, and then they still have to come a different day for their music mind games group anyway. So I think um, when I was in private practice, I um, gave the same day slots to the children who came the furthest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it would be a one year at a time agreement. So it would, you know, like timetabling is another whole thing that is like very difficult and loads of different ways to approach it. But lots of people, the kids get their time and then they just keep that time until they want to change. This is how it works with most of my students here, but I do think it's quite unfair because like, for example, I look at the kid of mine who's got the 4.15 slot before orchestra at 5.15 and then group at 6.45 on a Wednesday. And I think that's really lucky. There are so many families of mine who come twice a week to do those two things. And you just happen to have started at the time when I had that time available and it happens to not have changed. She does also live in Walthamstow, so it's quite far. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like it's okay. But I think, you know, if you, if you have a child who lives in that tower block, who has the slot right before or right after group class, that's not really fair because we have students coming miles and miles and miles. So I think it's another thing that you can, you can do whatever you want, full stop. The way to minimize the complaints about doing what you want is to be clear up and upfront about it before you do anything. The way to do that is to be a super awesomely organized person, which is not easy for all of us. So for example, if you decide, right, I'm gonna put my group classes on Thursday afternoon, and that means that my Thursday kids are going to have their same, the lesson on the same day. If you just set that up, the kids who have got their lesson on Thursdays already are going to be like, woo, yeah, I only have to come to see Jacqueline once a week, brilliant. And then you're going to have Monday and Tuesday kids' parents being like, well, how can we get a slot on Thursday? And it's up to you if you just say, well, sorry, yeah, my Thursdays are full, I can put you on a waiting list and you might get a Thursday slot in two years' time. Or from the start, you can be like, right, I'm going to change my timetable. I'm going to add in a group class. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take everybody's timetables or do a, um, what's that? Do Is it doodle poll that gives people where they can say they're available, unavailable, mm -hmm. maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like you can do that for your students so that you can see, mm -hmm. um, you know, or you can say to the people who have who come the furthest, you come the furthest, I want to give you a good slot, which one works for you, and fill it up by like, you know, like a donor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think as long as you are clear, this is why I'm doing this, this is how I'm doing it, you'll always get complaints because you can't please all of the people all of the time. I'm just going to be my next tattoo, like that, so that when, <laughs> someone, when someone complains, I'll just be like... <laughs> um, but I think as long as you are sure that you're doing the right thing that you want to do, and as long as you've got a good answer, I'm sorry, you can't have a Thursday group class and private lesson because you live 10 minutes walk away and my other student lives an hour away in the car, so I'm going to give her that slot because otherwise she's going to want to quit and I have her best interest as well as your best interest at heart. I don't want her to quit. I don't think you'll quit because you have to walk 10 minutes twice a week. Or one day 
day just for group lessons, so no one else, <laughs> private lesson on that day, yeah. just group lesson based on mm. every group. I think the thing, the thing when you set up your own private studio, there are many discussions to be had, and we will have these more. But the biggest difference to how you do it is whether you work by yourself, so you do everything you want your students to have, and it's all just you and your students. Or if you work in combination with other people, either somewhere like here, somewhere like at Nucleo, or you know, like. People who live in Birmingham, you know, there are kind of there's a group of like I don't know which part of Birmingham, but say West Birmingham, Suzuki. You know, there are three teachers who live nearish to each other. They hire a church hall on a Friday and they do their group classes together. And all those kids just have group class because those three teachers are doing beginners at four fifteen, break at five, book one to two at five fifteen, six o'clock, book three to four, break at six. 45, 7 till 8, advanced kids. There is no time for them to be doing those individual lessons as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it used to work with me when I, before we started Suzuki Hub, we had Suzuki Pub. <laughs> we learned, we had the, the room upstairs um, in, in a pub in Victoria Park where I live, uh, and we did group lessons on Wednesday, and it was exactly like that. There was no private lessons because it was just like beginners, book one, book two, book three, book four, ensemble, advanced kids. That was it, and that was like three thirty till eight or something. Mm. Uh, so all the students have to have their lessons on a different day if you do that. But if you decide, right, I'm going to have twenty five students. We're going to do group class. There's going to be, you know, beginner group and a book one group when you first start. Uh, then you are going to have to probably have other things on the same day as your group class that you do, and that's probably going to be private lessons. Mm -hmm. It might be music, mind games, might be general musicianship, might be choir. You know, there are all sorts of options. But the thing that makes the biggest difference practically is whether it's just you and just your students, or whether you work with other people. Mm -hmm. And there's no right or wrong. Like obviously, I'm a fan of the social side. We're, there are 20 of us here, but you know, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't do. You know, you get a lot more control if you work with your students and you're everything to them. Mm. That can be great, yeah. and it can also not be great. Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions? Great. Just before we go to lunch, please write down. Talk to the parents. Every 10 minutes in group class. <coughs> and at the beginning, in pre-twinkle group, aim to get them out of their seats helping children at least twice every week. Yes. So talk to the parents every 10 minutes in group class. And especially when you come in, say hello and make sure you're saying hello to the parents as well. Don't just sit down and start tuning. It's really easy. It's really easy to do that. I've seen people do it so many times. And in beginner classes, yeah, pre twinkle classes. Aim to have the student's parents helping them. twice each session. At least twice? Each session. So that might be, <coughs> we're going to do the cup game, can you come and help your child make their best bow roll? No. It might be, Walking the beat and clapping. It might be, you know, some of the parents helping the less advanced ones while the older ones are getting themselves, or not older, more advanced ones are getting themselves ready. It might be if you've done a solo, giving positive feedback. Just don't make them feel ignored. What was the second one you said after the cup game? Might be helping them. The, the kids get ready to play or like 
you know, maybe helping a, a tiny one who's just had two lessons soaking their arm while the, when the bigger ones are playing. Yeah. There's a busy stop stop or whatever. So it was, it's not necessarily every child needs a parent all the time that you do that. It will be sometimes the less advanced ones need help from their parents. Can you talk about, uh, talk to the parents about what you're doing, well, then, how it's helping, why are we doing this? I think that's the key. What, what are we doing and why? So if you've got to the end of a group class and you're going to play Sharks in the Water, you can just say, so parents, Sharks in the Water is a really great game to see if your child is really listening to the pieces and whether they know if the note I'm playing is right or not. And if they don't know, then either you're not doing enough listening at home yet, or they are zoning out when they're listening. So if you are doing listening really frequently and your child is not playing this game, you know, well, then maybe try humming when you're playing the music, see if they can sing along with it. Done. Fine, go back to music. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? Great. See you in an hour.